high cost, high debt. As the president announces plans to make universities more affordable, we'll look at how the U.S. education system compares with others around the world. From Washington, this is Inside Story. Welcome, I'm Libby Casey. A college education in the United States costs more than anywhere else in the world. The result? Americans carry the most student debt. It topped $1 trillion this year. And despite the high bill, American colleges are slipping in the international rankings. On Thursday, President Obama introduced a plan that he says will help make college more affordable. I'm proposing major new reforms that will shake up the current system, create better incentives for colleges to do more with less and deliver better value for students and their families. So what would the president's plan mean for American students and their future? We put that question to a recent graduate. Fiona Tang, who lives in Washington, D.C., told us her story. I am 29 years old. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in ecology, which is just a branch of biology, um, and then a master's degree in environmental science and management. Um, and between those two, I have a total of $85,000 in student loan debt. What does that mean for monthly payments? Um, monthly payments have varied depending on how much I knew about the payment plans that were available to me, how much money I was making. Um, but at this point in my life, which is the lowest monthly payments I've ever had, it's about $370 a month. How painful is that or how easy is that to pay <coughs> given your current income, where you're at in life, what you're doing with your career? Yeah. Um, at this point, I'm managing them fine because in the last, I'd say, year, year and a half, I've really tried to teach myself how to do that. Um, but, you know, upon immediately graduating from grad school, there's really kind of no knowledge on how to manage it, what options are available to me. And I think at that time, um, it was the most difficult to deal with. Um, it became a source of problem in, you know, personal relationships. Um, it really kind of pulled a lot of things into questions for me. My career, am I doing the right things? Did I make the right choice in my degree? So it had been very tough. Did you have any idea of what you were getting yourself into when you applied for colleges, got into a school, got ready to go yeah. to both undergrad and graduate, and you took out all these tens of thousands yeah. of dollars in loans? Um, <laughs> no, not really. I think, I think it, it just was a, a natural process, right? You kind of think you come out of high school, you college is a natural next step um, because I come from an immigrant background and my mom is the one who raised my sister and myself um, after we moved to the States you know I don't think that learning about the American college system was her priority and so there was very little information about hey I'm the first person to go to college I could probably get a scholarship or a grant to cover my expenses but I didn't and there was no information for me about that so all loans. Um, grad school, another you know, kind of natural step, thinking that higher education is a way to go, um, pulled out all the loans that I needed for it. And quite honestly, really didn't even know what the total was until I w was near graduation from grad school. And that's not just my story, but a lot of people's story. OK, you're 29 yeah. years old. You have more than $80,000 in debt. How old will you be when you finish oh. paying off your college loans? <laughs> It's a good question. I, it's so scary to think about this. Uh, probably about 56. Fiona, did your college degree and your graduate degree prepare you for both your career field and then just entering the workforce as an adult? Um, you know, it's funny. I think the I look at the undergraduate degree and the master's degree pretty separately. I think undergrad was difficult coming out of that. I did not feel prepared for the work field at all. Um, my degree was fairly limiting in what I wanted to do and I did not feel like during college I was able to cultivate other areas that I could have been good at to, to actually um, work in. Um, I think the master's degree was great in preparing me for the real world in terms of being able to speak to people, networking, and, and building a great network of folks. Um, I, I actually at this point I'm not working in either one of those fields but I you know definitely find that there's value in both of them. 
Joining us to take a closer look at the president's new plan is David Bergeron, vice president for post-secondary education at the Center for American Progress and a former assistant secretary at the Department of Education. And from Las Vegas, Natalia Abrams, the co-founder of studentdebtcrisis.org, a group that advocates for universal affordable education. Also Neil McCluskey here in the studio, associate director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom. But first, here are the facts, and here are the key points of the president's plan. It starts with a rating system that ranks universities on how much they cost and how many students they actually graduate. Schools that keep tuition, tuition low and graduate a high percentage of students will get more taxpayer dollars, and those that don't won't, at least in theory. But the president needs congressional approval to make this change. Finally, it expands President Obama's pay-as-you-earn program, which caps loan repayments at 10% of a recent graduate's salary. David Bergeron, let's start with you. What would the president's proposals mean for young people like Fiona, who we just met? Well, the first thing that it will mean for Fiona is that they will have access to greater information about the post-secondary choices that are available to them. So the kind of the things that Fiona was talking about, about not knowing about other alternatives, the ways in which to finance it, that would be addressed through, the, through something that can be done through executive action, no legislation required. Then the ranking system would, that he would develop would be used then to decide how much money institutions, students attending particular institutions would get, making sure that the students uh, that are most successful and are attending the most successful institutions get the most aid. Second thing it would do was really stimulate innovation, getting colleges to do the things they need to do to increase graduation rates, reduce time to degree, and drive down costs. The last thing it would do, as you pointed out, is, is make sure more information is available about pay as you earn repayment options. You know, Fiona made the point really very well that sometimes it takes a while to get in the right repayment plan. Getting in the right repayment plan shouldn't be an accident. The, the president has called on on Secretary Duncan to do a better job informing people about the options. And I think taken together, those elements will dramatic, dramatically improve um, the, the outcomes for our students. Natalia Abrams, does the President's plan go far enough? Um, no. I mean, the, the short answer is no, but we at studentdebtcrisis.org are thrilled that he's speaking about this. And you know, the fact that he's speaking about this after the rate doubling vote um, not during an election year, it, it goes to show that he it's something he really cares about. So I think it's our job and the jobs of other organizations to continue to push, but we are so happy to hear that he's speaking about this and these reforms, they're good enough, but we can do better. Okay, Ms. Abrams, tell us about the congressional history here on student loan rates since you brought it up. Explain it a little bit for us. So um, last year and this year, there were two votes to uh, double student loan rates. Um, this year, actually on July 1st, the rates did double to, I believe, 6%. Then there was a vote in Congress a few weeks ago, which brought the rate back down to 3.87%. And so that was better, obviously. We do not want 6% rates. But the only problem with that right now is that it ties it to the federal treasury note. Um, but there is a cap of, I believe, 8.25%, uh, which we could see in the next two, or um, excuse me, next four to six years. But hopefully, with these measures, something will be done before we ever see 8% interest rates on student loans. Neil McCluskey, grade the president's proposals for us. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to give it a grade because a lot of what we're hearing sounds good, at least on the surface. So, producing more information about graduation rates and things like that. But we have to look at the timeline. What he's really saying is we're not going to have this rating until 2015. And we're not going to have that until there have been town halls and things like that to discuss it with lots of stakeholders. So we can't really say what it's going to tell us yet because we don't have a firm plan. And then I think what's really going to put the meat behind this, you know, real power behind it, would be when you link these ratings to access to aid. It's not necessarily a good thing, but that is what would really put pressure on schools. But we're not going to see that proposal till 2018. And that's got to be approved by Congress. So it sounds good, but there's so many details that we don't know that are crucial. The components of the rating, the weighting of those components, and what the uh, ramifications will be based on how you do on those components. All that's missing now, so it's hard to say what grade this is going to get. So what do you think of the phil philosophical decision to, to link schools' abilities to turn out graduates who are successful with how much federal aid they receive? Yeah, it, it's troubling. And it's troubling because 
when you have a metric like this that you're going to try and apply to all schools, you have to remember that all students are different, all schools are different, and it, it, it's bothersome that you might have a school that focuses on the arts where people are willing to take on debt to do something that's not going to have a big payoff, and they'll get treated differently than, say, someone who goes into engineering that does have a big payoff I in terms of what you're going to earn, but may not be as fulfilling as an individual. And so it's really hard to say you should take a blunt instrument on something that isn't very blunt. David Bergeron, is it a blunt instrument? How can you really use this sort of a rating system to evaluate a, a successful school? Well, you know, we've had rating systems mm -hmm. for years. The newest news and world reports and others have ranked schools. They've, those ranking systems those have driven spending behavior on the part of colleges that, that create the problem that we have today. They invest in things that don't return value in terms of the, the uh, outcomes of students. So the, if you create a good rating system, then you can drive the behavior in the direction that we want it to, which is you know, more low-income students being served effectively in institutions. And, and the thing about this is we know what to do. There are institutions in the United States that serve low-income students, and they have very good graduation rates. They have high job placement rates. They have high earnings outcomes for their students, and we should be leveraging that, those lessons and driving the changes that are necessary to get the outcomes more consistently. Neil McCluskey, what do you think of holding student loans at 10% of the income of recent graduates so they don't end up having to spend more of what they're earning on paying off their loans? Yeah, th this is another problem. So people, when they take on these loans, they do bear some responsibility. We tend to act like the students shouldn't have been doing more research into what they were taking on. And we've got to remember there is another side to this, and that's taxpayers who are real human beings. The concern is that if you're not paying back the total of what you've promised to pay back, that's money somebody else has to put into the federal government to fund all sorts of other things. And we can't forget those are real flesh and blood human beings who have to bear that extra cost, and they weren't the ones who agreed to these loan terms. Well, we'll keep this discussion going in just a moment, but first, a break. When we return, higher education, higher costs, and their impact on Americans' ability to get ahead in life. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Inside Story. On today's show, we're looking at President Obama's new plan to make college more affordable. During his speech on Thursday, President Obama said that nothing is more important to the idea of economic mobility, that you can make it if you try, than a good education. Let's take a look at how beneficial a college degree actually is. A study by the Brookings Institution shows college graduates earning on average half a million dollars more than non-graduates over the course of their careers. And a study by Georgetown University puts that number even higher at $2.7 million. But research by the Heritage Foundation, which took into account tuition payments, student debt loads, and salaries, showed much less of an advantage for college graduates. Over a lifetime, it equaled under $300,000. Still with us, David Bergeron, Vice President for Post-Secondary Education at the Center for American Progress. And in Las Vegas, Natalia Abrams, the co-founder of StudentDebtCrisis.org. And Neil McCluskey, Associate Director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom. So you get out of college, you've learned a lot, your brain is full. What does it actually mean for your earning potential, David? It has dramatic impacts on a student's earning potential when they come out of college. And really, when I talk about college, I really mean any type of post-secondary education. Each year of college, each year beyond high school, really drives up earnings. And I think that, that whether you talk about the Brookings study or the Heritage study, they all show that there are tremendous benefits from an earnings perspective on coll for college graduates. And Natalia Abrams, what about higher education? What if you go farther, you get a specialized degree, something like a master's in engineering or a medical degree? What does that mean for your future? Um, well, I mean, all the studies say that you're going to do better, you're going to make more. But, you know, in the short term, it just doesn't feel like it. I mean, right now we're seeing 50, uh, roughly 50% of people 18 to, 18 to 34 that aren't buying houses, about 40% aren't purchasing new cars. So I think in the short term, we are seeing a, an effect on upward social mobility. I mean, maybe in the long term, but you know, I, I, I've been out of college for the last 10 years, and right now it sure doesn't feel like 
I'm quite doing better than some of my friends that didn't go to college. I think it will get better. I value my education. It was one of the best decisions I made. But it's a little scary right now looking towards retirement funds and having children and really investing in my future. And so Natalia Abrams, take that out to the national level. If Americans are having trouble paying off their debt, how does that hamper innovation or Americans' ability to, to take risks and, and try new things if they're caught up in loans? I think first and foremost, just the mental effect. I have so many friends that are in really sticky loan situations. Some have e even gone so far as defaulting. And it's that bubble, you know, that thought that stays in their head all the time. And it makes them not think clearly. They have to take jobs that they might not want to want to take just because they need to make a salary versus interning or taking positions where they can move up in their career. Um, I think we're seeing students or graduates not feel the freedom that they could feel if they didn't have this large burden of debt. Neil McCluskey, square this for us. You want to get ahead in life, so you go to the best schools, you get the best degrees, but you may have a lot of debt because some of those come with really big price tags. So what does it mean for Americans trying to get ahead? Yeah, there, there's so many variables you got to look at. So first of all, when you look at those average earnings, first you see that wide disparity on what people are estimating. It's because there are lots of things you got to consider. You know lost income when you're in school and things like that. The other really important part about this is that's an average. And we have to remember there are going to be a lot of people who aren't at that average. And it's so crucial to understand that if you major in one thing, like engineering, you stand to make a lot of money. If you major in something else, like psychology, you stand to make a lot less. And you've got to look at all of these things. Then the question is the debt. For some people, it's going to be worth taking on the debt. If you take on average debt or more to become an, an engineer, you can pay that off right away. Others probably shouldn't take on that debt. And then the, the root question, I think what the president's trying to deal with is, is the price of college just too high? It might still be great to go to college, get an education, but maybe it should cost 50% of what it costs now. And there's good reason to believe that it is heavily inflated, and it might be inflated because of so much aid. David Bergeron. Well, I disagree that it's because of so much aid. I think that the research over the years has shown that, that at least in terms of federal grant aid, there's no impact. Loan aid, the jury's still out. I don't think, I haven't seen anything that's compelling uh, that says that loan aid drives up costs. I think there are lots of reasons costs have gone up. States have disinvested. Uh, private sector institutions, f nonprofits lost money in the stock market when the, when the economy went down and they haven't recouped those yet, so they don't have the endowment revenues to, to, that they can apply to uh, reduce the cost for students. Um, and, and the for-profit schools, um, you know, they, they had tremendous demand as the economy was soft and, and, and they priced accordingly. And so I think there are lots of things that were happening. Uh, but I do think we, we really need to look very hard at the driving down the, the, pri the cost of education and the price, looking at things that institutions can and should do to get their costs under control, um, you know, looking, at, looking very hard at ways to, to um, economize um, save money, deliver degrees in a much shorter and much uh, less expensive way. And the, and the president is calling for that innovation, which I think is so critical. Well, we'll take a quick break. And when we return, how U.S. higher education stacks up compared to the rest of the world and what we can learn from other countries. Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside Story. U.S. universities rank among the best in the world. In fact, this year, 13 out of the top 20 universities are here in the U.S., but they're also the most expensive, and it's not clear if students are getting what they paid for. According to the Global Higher Education Rankings of 2010, on average, students in the U.S. paid close to $14,000 a year to go to college. In Australia, you'd pay about $7,500. In Canada, students pay about $6,000 per year. And universities in England are subsidized by the government. Students there pay just over $5,000 a year. In France, higher education is government funded, so out-of-pocket costs are very low. And students pay about $600 on average a year. Well, still with us, David Bergeron, Vice President for Post-Secondary Education at the Center for American Progress and a former Assistant Secretary at the Department of Education. 
And from Las Vegas, Natalia Abrams, the co-founder of StudentDebtCrisis.org, a group that advocates for universal affordable education. We're also joined by Neil McCluskey, Associate Director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom. David Bergeron, why is it so much more expensive to go to college in the United States than other countries? Well, it's, you said in your introduction, a lot of other countries provide tremendous uh, levels of public subsidy. And that was historically true in the United States. Our public institutions were largely publicly funded. Over the last three decades, we've seen an erosion in that subsidy, and that has dramatically increased the cost of our public system. Neil McCluskey, you're shaking your head now. I mean, respond to what David Bergeron's saying, and then why are schools so expensive here? Yeah, it's true. I think that one of the reasons they're so expensive is we subsidize, in particular, more and more the student rather than the school. Historically, though, American colleges start off largely as private schools. You only get into the big public schools eventually when you get into the 1860s or 1890s. Uh, and it's, it's not true, actually, that we've had massive decreases in subsidies for those public schools. States have actually increased the total amount they spend on their public college and university over the last 25 or 30 years. On a per pupil basis, that's gone down, although not precipitously. It kind of goes like a roller coaster. And that's because enrollment has gotten so much bigger. Natalia Abrams, what would you do? You said you wish the president's plan went farther. How would you lower the cost and improve education? So we um, supported an initiative in the House uh, that was done by Representative Karen Bass, H.R. 1330, which would take the president's pay-as-you-earn or income-based repayment a step further. So it would be 10 years instead of 20 to 25 and 10 percent of your discretionary income. We feel that you sh it shouldn't take 20 to 30 years. Uh, you heard Fiona say she's not going to be 50. She'll be 52 in, when she pays off her student loan debt or 57. I mean, that's mortgages. It was never intended for a college loan to be the same as a mortgage 20 to 40 years. So I would, we would propose that it would be a faster repayment plan um, if you were in trouble. And the great thing about this plan is that it would, would allow the defaulted borrower to enroll in this program. Right now, there's no programs out there, unless actually David might know of something, but to my knowledge, there's no programs out there for students that have defaulted to get back into a system and figure out a reasonable way to pay off their debt. And we want people to pay off their low education debt. It really is important. I agree that it, there is some personal responsibility. But we have to create a fair system so people feel that they can pay it off in a reasonable amount of time, not 30 to 40 years and when they're in their mid-50s. Okay, Neil McCluskey, what would you do to improve the situation? Well, I think we have to do what's going to sound counterintuitive, which is we need to reduce aid. We, I think we ultimately need to phase out student aid. And the reason is because actually there's a huge amount of empirical evidence, as well as kind of Economics 101, that indicates that schools raise their prices in large part because they can, and it's student aid that lets them do it. Do you have a 15-second response, David Bergeron? Well, certainly I, I don't agree with that assessment. I think that uh, the, the evidence so far is that uh, aid doesn't drive up costs. I think that, that there's lots that institutions can do and will do if we put the right incentives in place. All right, well, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. That's it for now for the team in Washington, D.C., and from me, Libby Casey. But you can keep the conversation going by logging onto our Facebook page, and you can also send us your thoughts on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story AM. You can reach me directly on Twitter at Lib Casey. Thanks for watching.